So welcome to the second of our collective sessions um, where we're exploring different issues from the perspective of groups that we're working with around the country and particularly people experiencing poverty. Um, last time we had a collective in July, we looked at church responses to COVID. Uh, this month we're looking at community responses and we'll be hearing about the inspiring work that some of our grassroots and community partners have been involved in from Cornwall, from South Wales, from Manchester, from York and from Newcastle. And we hope you'll enjoy the next hour or so. Uh, but first, before we get into the conversation about community responses, I want to introduce my colleague uh, Gavin, who's going to talk about a new initiative we're starting uh, this autumn, Challenge Poverty Week. Um, across England and Wales um, in October and we're hoping many of you will want to join in with Challenge Poverty Week. Um, so I'm going to introduce Kevin to come and say a few words about uh, Challenge Poverty Week and what it is and how to get involved. So Gavin, welcome. And uh, Challenge Poverty Week, what is it, when is it and how can people get involved? Hi everybody, yep, I'm Gavin from Church Action on Poverty. Uh, Challenge Poverty Week is happening in England and Wales for the first time this year from October the 12th to October the 18th. Um, Challenge Poverty Week's been running in Scotland for the past seven years and it was held in London last year. But it's the first time it's been held in, in other parts of the UK. It's essentially a chance to concentrate our efforts and attention on the, the many incredible pieces of work that have been done by community groups around the country, um, helping to challenge and alleviate poverty in their own communities, and also to focus on some of the solutions that could make a difference long term. Um, I'm going to see if I can share my screen here and just run through what we aim to achieve. Um, these are the, the aims of Challenge Poverty Week. The aim is to raise voices in unison against poverty and to show the, the shared aspiration we've all got to live in a more just and compassionate country, is to show what is already being done to challenge poverty, to build awareness and nurture support for the long-term solutions, and also to, to change the conversation around poverty and help end the stigma by making sure that some of the voices that are very often ignored are, are front and centre in the, in the conversation. Um, we are drawing up various resources at the moment. We've got a a toolkit that's just coming together, lots of social media banners and pictures and posters and videos and some sort of template letters. And we're also going to be running a few workshops in the next three weeks, which um, is probably best. I'll probably put the link to those in the chat box and people can, can sign up if they want to. Um, but yeah, we're going to be on hand to provide a lot of technical support. So if you do want to, to run Zoom events, things like regionalized discussion events or storytelling sessions, um, we can help with that and we can help to ensure that you get the audience you want to get as well, inviting councillors, MPs, journalists, other community groups, etc. Um, so yeah, I'll share the link to the website and to those workshops. And if you want to get involved, that'd be fantastic. And I'll just briefly introduce uh, Jess, who's working with Gav. Um, so you can see Jess as well. And uh, when Jess has joined us, then um, and just particularly, do you want to say a little bit about the um, social media side of it that we're hoping to promote? If you can't organise an event, then other ways you can actually raise the profile on, on social media. Um, yeah, uh, we've set up a Facebook page. Uh, which is Challenge Poverty Week England and Wales, a Twitter which is at CP underscore E underscore W and a Instagram which is uh, Challenge Poverty Week so if you want to follow those we'll be sharing all the resources and stuff so yeah thanks get involved. Great um, so uh, yeah and if anybody's got uh, queries about the week then Gavin and Jess are working pretty much full on it for the next few weeks. And it's the 12th to the 18th of October. So uh, look out for more. And if you've got inspiring ideas about what you want to do during the week, uh, let us know. Um, 
and um, we hope it's going to be a good week. We've uh, piloting it really this year, um, and then we hope uh, you know a lot of groups will get involved, individuals can get involved, and really it's an opportunity to raise the profile of the issue, a really vital issue this autumn, given the impact of the. Uh, coronavirus crisis on the numbers of people in poverty, the numbers of people in debt, the numbers that are now unemployed, which is uh, going up as we speak. Um, so, yeah, Challenge Poverty Week. Um, so now I'm going to introduce um, Penny, um, who uh, is one of our grassroots activists from uh, Biker uh, in Newcastle who's been a regular contributor to our gatherings, which we've been held uh, through lockdown, we're holding on a weekly basis through, uh, through Zoom. Uh, so afternoon, Penny. Hello folks, I've only got, um, what have I got? 13 minutes. <laughs> you're, you're a busy woman, Penny. I am a very busy woman, I've got a school run to do, so. Uh -huh. Now so, they now they're back at school. Yeah. So what's been happening on Biker in terms of a kind of community response to the crisis? What what's been going on for you locally? Well, the community response. Um, they set up a mutual aid, which came out of just the fact of different people joining together and supporting other people, which was very good because it started to get to the people that needed it. Um, they did like sort of the got me to do cookery so I was cooking meals which I still am doing but not as much so I cook for the sheltered accommodation so these were the like the older folk that couldn't get out um, so they got meals um, twice a week off me and then three times a week off a, another company that was doing it uh, which was Food Nation so we like sort of all joined together and all pooled our resources and our know-how on what we could do um, they also set up like sort of like a mini food bank, but there was no um, restrictions on who could get it. So it was a case of if you needed food, you got it. Um, and also things like going and picking prescriptions up and taking dogs for walk and, you know, go and do people shopping if they couldn't get out, which was, you know, really good to get back into like some sort of community spirit which has helped a lot on the estate. What kind of a place would you say Biker is? Um, Biker is very multicultural. Um, there's, I would say there's just about everywhere from every country living in Biker. It's not a massive estate. I mean, there is the old town and like the new estate, but I would say it's about a, uh, 60-40 split, um, where I think I would say 40% of the estate actually works, 60% don't. So there's um, a lot of poverty around. There's an awful lot of poverty around, but there's an awful lot of pride around as well. Yeah. So this, this is what we've been working on over the last three years, is to like sort of get people to open up and say, well, actually, you know, I could do with some help. And we do it in a way that... You know, it doesn't make them feel worthless or useless. And what's your own situation, Penny? Um, I am still unemployed. Um, I now get carer's allowance, which, you know, means I don't have to have the hassle of looking for a job. I'm still basically volunteering seven days a week. So I'm still on the go constantly, constantly fielding messages, dropping food off, things like that, you know, doing Zoom conferences, you know, take, yeah. take part in people's, you know, papers research and stuff like that. So I'm still pretty active for all, I don't leave the house too often and I certainly don't leave the estate very often. So even though you've kind of been stuck at home, you're still being part of the community response? Yeah, very much so. And, and how important is it to you that there is a kind of community level response? It's not just the, the council 
uh, or you know, or, or kind of statutory agencies that, that people are looking after themselves, really. It's a pride thing. You know, you run about reducing the stigma. You know, people are still proud people. You know, just because they haven't got anything doesn't mean to say they don't, they don't have pride. So it's known what they are and what they're about, where you can, they can come and knock on your door and say, well, you know, I'm a bit short this week. Um, have you got anything to help us out? And they know they can come and do that with neighbours now as well and think, well, if I'm a bit stuck, I can go and ask such and such. And it's, you know, it's not making them feel worthless. Mm. But then they also know that somebody can knock on them and say, well, I've got extra of this, so I'll share that with you. And that, I guess, is what mutual aid is, isn't it? It's people helping each other out. And one week it might be you're the helper, and the next week it might be that you need a bit of help. Exactly. You know, yes, I've had to have people go and pick up my prescription, especially in the first month where we weren't allowed out at all. You know, so other people were going and doing our stuff getting shopping in and knowing who's got what supermarkets got what in because there was such a shortage. So it was a case of, you know, you pass that knowledge on, oh, by the way, I got extra bag of pasta. Does anybody need it? You know, and it was just joining up the dots like that mm -hmm. and making it more community focused and not just a handout. Yeah. So... What would you say to people that would say, you know, there isn't the kind of community spirit that there used to be on in, uh, you know, on the kind of estate that you're on? Um, there is now. More people are realising that community is everything. Um, people so talk more to each other. Your neighbours talk more to each other. So actually, that's a kind of positive. I mean, we, you know, we could we could talk for hours about the negatives about the crisis, but that's actually something that good that's come out of the situation. It's something that's very good. It's also highlighted um, where there are a lot of digital exclusion that we have on this estate, mm. but it's also highlighted the fact that you know other people are willing to share. You know, if you can't do a universal credit online because you don't have the facilities, you know, your neighbour will pop up and say, well, you know, you can come and use it in our house. I can't print your free school meal vouchers off. That's fine. I've got a printer. You know, I'll print them off for you. So that's the type of thing. I mean, nobody's got anything. But what little bit we have do, we'll share with whoever. That's a great... Uh, that's a great... Um parable I think or uh, yeah of sharing so thanks thanks for coming on Penny great keep up the good work keep smiling and uh, I better not keep you too long away from uh, doing your school run yep I've got to go and pick three little kiddies up excellent well we'll see you again soon and uh, I hope the sun keeps shining, smiling on, on Biker it is doing it's lovely <laughs> bye folks <laughs> So from um, the northeast, we're going to head to the southwest, uh, to um, to Cornwall, um, and to hear a bit about what some of the community responses have been in Cornwall. And uh, to tell us a bit about that, we're joined by Andrew Howell from End Hunger Cornwall, um, who's also connected with the Cornwall Independent Poverty Forum. So afternoon, Andrew. Good afternoon, how are you? I'm very well, thank you. Uh, I'm sure it's as sunny down there as it is up here. I, I, I don't want to burst your bubble, but it's actually misty today. Yes, the, this oh, is the Cornwall right. thing. The country is in heat wave, apart, look at the map, Cornwall, mist. But you, um, you, you have burst my bubble. I'm, I'm terribly I'm sorry. Good. We're saving the sunny days for when you can get down. Okay. <laughs> So, uh, Andrew, what, you know, what's been the community response to the crisis um, in, in Cornwall that you, you know, you've seen and been part of? Yeah, it's very much as Penny said. I mean, Cornwall, as you know, we're way out of the way on the peninsula. Cornwall exists on mutual aid. It, it has for hundreds of years, to be honest. The, the, the community thing in Cornwall has always been huge. Um, possibly because 
this part of the world is very used to being in a demonos situation. If you look back at the 19th century, we were the richest area in the world because of all the mines and the China clay and all that stuff. And yet all of the people that lived and worked here still had nothing. And they looked after themselves. And it was very much, again, as Penny said, you know, if we've got it in the cupboard, you can share it. And if we haven't, then, you know, we, we go without and we move along. So the, as such, Cornwall is, again, would, I think we're probably uniquely stopped in the amount of charity support that we already have in place. It's not a case that we have charity schemes in most areas that do a bit of support. Virtually every area is run on a complete support network of charity things already. Um, when the whole COVID thing started, quite a lot of people uh, sort of looked to people like Cornwall Independent Poverty Forum, um, the Voluntary Sector Forum, and Volunteer Cornwall, and we, and who coordinated a response very quickly. So we we had the knowledge of the things that were out there. We had the knowledge of the things we could do. Um, the most important thing was is we formed a very powerful alliance very quickly to to get voices on the council, because the truth is that authority panicked, and we we stepped in and, and helped them out big time. Um, and one of the things about having a voice is I know the uh, independent poverty forums uh, worked on a report, a just and fair future for Cornwall. And I think it has. Were... Funnily enough, I thought you were going to ask about that. Ah. <laughs> <Ta -da>. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's it's available if you go on the Cornwall Independent Poverty Forum, our website, or just Google Cornwall, and you'll be able to find a copy of this. It's 96 or however 70 pages or whatever. And um, we we pulled it together through the crisis. Um, 20 major stakeholders from a, a, across the voluntary sector, all areas. Uh, I wrote an article to do with food poverty. We've had articles to do with domestic abuse, to do with employment, to do with child poverty, to, to do with the whole gamut of it. And we've put this document together, which is, is very much based on the speaking truth to power. It's not about statistics. It's about this is really happening and it's really happening now. And you need to do something. We are taking that document around to all of our MPs. Uh, the idea is we will literally lobby the MPs now with different stakeholders are going to see different MPs of the ones that will see us. I'm not going to go too mad on that, but my friend George won't give us an appointment. Um, we've seen Steve from Newquay and Austell. It was a tetchy meeting, but the thing is he's around the table. We were going to see Derek Thomas of Penzance and Ives. Uh, always got on very well with Derek. I know you met him at the conference, Neil. Um, we, we've got a meeting with the Truro MP, Cheryl. Um, so it, it's very much about, yeah, we can give you statistics till the cows come home, but you'll just quote statistics back. This is an absolute document of truth. And what we're going to do is we're going to do another one in 12 months' time to say this is what the truth is now, and we will keep putting the truth under your nose until you decide to do something to change it. That's the gist. So that's, that's fantastic. And I would recommend anybody to get hold of uh, the report. And I think during Challenge Poverty Week, we're going to have a, a whole Zoom session just looking at, um, at that as a, as a way of speaking truth to power. So why do you think, you know, alongside the action on the ground, why for you is it important to actually speak truth to power? Oh, I, yeah, I, it, it, it's the reason I touched on it. When you are talking to power, you know, whether you like it or you know, whether you like them or not, one, you have to have that dialogue. That's important. What, what, and you have to swallow whatever pride you need to do to open that dialogue. If you quote statistics and reports, power will always quote a different statistic and report back at you. That They will shoot you down in flames. That, that is their job. That is that, their profession. That is politics and local government. If you go in there to meet an MP with a family with four kids that haven't eaten and dad couldn't get work and he was sanctioned, there's a likelihood they will turn around, well, I can't comment on isolated cases. That's the next thing you get. So you start to build documents of these truths and then it starts to become much more difficult for them to batter into the long grass, which is what they do all of the time. So yeah, it, Whenever you speak to an MP or a local councillor or a parish councillor or whoever you speak to, cabinet minister, if he'll give me an appointment, um, 
just speak real stories that you can back up with real people and it's it's very powerful they find it hard to dodge that um, well uh, that's a great initiative and I'd love to think more groups around the country would do the same thing and speak truth to power and it's certainly something within church action and property that we're really keen uh, to support groups to do um, so do you want to just say again the the name of the report and where people can find it yeah it's the Cornwall Independent Poverty Forum if you just google that it's called a fair and just future for Cornwall. Um, I'm sure there's a link to it on the Church Action Poverty website as well. There is. There's a blog about it, and we'll, we'll put up a link um, when we share. Yeah, um, but it, it, it's it, it's it's a fair old read, but it, it's it's you know it's a very powerful document. And the important thing about the document is not just a report, is it? It's a tool then for speaking speaking to people that are in power. Yeah, but when we when we authored our our pieces to put in, it was. The sort of brief was okay it's great to tell people what it's like uh, very much with the end hunger thing you can't eat the view it's great to tell people what it's like now but it's actually let's have real stories of what it's like now let, let, let's frame this moment and and put it there so we can cross reference back to it and and if it's worse in 12 months time place your bets we can reference that as a truth not just a statistic hopefully it'll okay. be much better well, let's hope so, um, and keep up the good work. And uh, may the sun start shining again in Cornwall. As soon as you come in, let us know, we'll turn it on. Okay. <laughs> nice to see you again. And you. Take care, sir. Um, so from Cornwall, we're now heading to uh, Wales. Um, and uh, one of our partners um, that we've been working with for a number of years now, Purple Shoots, um, who work to set up self-reliant groups um, as we do in uh, the northwest of England and we've got partners elsewhere um, and um, we're going to share a, a, a video now um, from um, Emma who works for Purple Shoots uh, about um, a really creative idea they had during lockdown um, for a virtual village fate. Um, now the quality of the sound on the video isn't uh, isn't ideal but there are subtitles so you should be able to follow what Emma's is saying uh, either by listening or by uh, reading the subtitles or a mixture of both. Hey, my name is Emma Winsgrave. I'm the self-reliant group manager at Purple Shoots in South Wales and the South West of England. We have around 40 SLGs which I count. Um, they're groups for people who want to take control of their lives and make a change either for themselves or their community by working together. When lockdown hit, it had a massive impact on all of our group members. Obviously, they could no longer meet. Um, we tried to do all sorts of things to support them, and they did a lot to support each other. You know, we used WhatsApp, phone, um, Facebook, and Zoom for meetings. But by the time we got to the end of May, um, we were really aware that of needed something new, we needed something to energise people, um, we needed something to give people a real kind of sense of community. We also needed something that was going to be accessible and cheap and easy for us to do. We're a very small charity, we don't have a lot of resources. So we came up with the Virtual Village Show. Um, we ran it for three weeks um, in June, uh, it was on Facebook. So it was very easy to do, free to enter. Um, you could enter just by posting a photo. Um, it was pretty cheap for us because um, we spent £100 um, promoting it. And that gave us an enormous reach. Um, our posts were interacted with by 30,000 separate people. And we had hundreds of entries to our competition. Um, we ran uh, games like Hoopla, we ran competitions like Guess the Weight of the Cake, um, and we also ran lots and lots of prize categories, over 20. Um, so in cooking, gardening, crafts, art and fun stuff. So for cooking, uh, people baked scones and cakes and pies and international dishes. That's amazing. Um, people um, who were interested in gardening, um, entered their best flower, their best fruit, their best vegetable, 
and also there was flower arrangements in a shoe print. Uh, the crafters uh, made handmade bags, and bunting and knitted garments, and greeting cards, wooden metalwork and other craft projects. Uh, the artists entered original artworks and also original photographs. And for fun stuff we had a fancy dress competition and also a pet show which was astonishingly well entered uh, with all sorts of pets. Um, it was brilliant. Um, we didn't offer any prizes, just glory, um, but we still got vast numbers of entries and we found particularly from some of our members who have mental health issues and who had really struggled with having to interact with people live and things like Zoom. So because the the village fair didn't have any um, live elements. It was could we do it all at our own pace. We've got lots and lots of entries there. Um, we also found it amazing the amount of kind of confidence that people got and um, joy from winning various competitions. Um, you know, they got lovely comments from other people, but also Liza um, Kellett from Trust Leeds, who has about 15 satellite groups up there was telling me that one of the ladies from one of her groups who suffers terribly with anxiety you know, and I really encouraged her to enter you know, she posted photos on her behalf and when she came in the top three for International Dish she was a great achievement um, she was just so kind of proud and happy and it made such a difference to her and we could really see that kind of community building across all of the SRGs so the way that people kind of supported each other, appreciated what they were all doing. Um, so we absolutely loved running it. Um, we will be doing it again in 2021, whether there's a pandemic or not. Um, but we're also exploring other ways to continue to build the community of SRG members, you know, not just within our groups, but across the UK and worldwide. So uh, watch this space. So now um, we're moving uh, up the country again to Manchester um, and um, at Church Action and Poverty we've been supporting uh, the Poverty Truth Commission in Manchester for the past uh, 18 months or so. Um, it launched um, early last year and we're joined by uh, one of the grassroots commissioners, uh, Gemma. So good afternoon Gemma. Hi, has it come through? Yeah, yeah, we can hear you um, loud and clear. So, um, do you want to say a bit about the, the Poverty Truth Commission, uh, Gemma, and why, why you got involved in it? I heard about Poverty Truth from would you believe, one of the civic leaders who was on it, he put me forward. And Poverty Truth is 12, pe 12 grassroots commissioners, which are people who have lived experience of poverty, who meet up with civic leaders, we've got a police officer, um, doctors, local councillors and other people from different organisations. We've got sort of a banker as well that comes down to see us, which they're the civic leaders. And they, we talk about lived experiences of what we've done, what we've been through. And we did a lot of get to know you sessions, which were really good with the civic with the civic leaders. Just before lockdown, we would separated into three task groups, looking at what area of poverty we were going to look at and work with. Um, and can you remember what they are? Child poverty, exploitation, and I always forget the other one. Nikki will remember the other one better than me. And you know, I, I've forgotten it as well. Well, we'll remember before before the end of the session. So that was that being the result of several months of meeting face to face. Benefits have just been told. <laughs> Benefits. There we go. Somebody's prompting. Um, so that had been the, the commission meeting face to face uh, in a room for about six or seven months, hadn't it? Yes. And then lockdown came and all that had to come to a stop. Um, but it didn't yeah. mean the work of the Commission's come to a stop, did it? So no. what happened since March 
to kind of keep you all connected? We've started off with, we have our meetings on Zoom like this and we had, we did some word things, that, well, sentences about what's normal and what's not normal. But we worked with um, other people as well. We worked with um, Manchester Council on a few things, which were crisis food response, which was about the boxes that were going out, about talking about has been closing, closing the crisis food and how to deal with that best. And then our Manchester, we worked with as well, their strategy restart which was about things that go on in the community, like buses and stuff like that. Just excuse me, I caught a cold. It's a cold, nothing worse. Yeah. No, nothing worse than a cold. <laughs> so what, in terms of the crisis response stuff, um, what, what was that, you say that was about the food. Yeah. So what, the, what was your role within that? We spoke to the council, deciding, helping them, we were talking through some of us that have had them or some of us that have had been delivering them as well. Some of the group have been out doing the parcels and helping out. We're talking about how to bring it to an end. Yeah. And how to close it in the end. And it did, to end sooner or later. And how important was it for you that the council was actually listening to you and, and your experience? It was actually really good to for them to ask for help rather than just to close it and end it with no support for everyone. Um, and you felt that you got a real hearing? Yeah, they, they listened, really listened to what we had to say. She even asked us questions as well, which was really good. It was a really good session, that one. And is that your experience maybe in the past, that the council's good at listening or not so good at listening? No, not good at listening at all. They normally make decisions and close it without thinking of what's going on from the people. So that's a big difference to actually coming out and listening. Yeah. Um, and that for you, is, that's part of what Poverty Truth Commission's about then, isn't it? Yes, Poverty Truth. We know that nothing happens fast, but we like to see little changes. I do as well. I really like to see where the little changes happen. A little bit of policy change is just because something has been, one of the group grassroots commissions have been listened to. And, and sometimes a little change in something the council does can actually be quite a big change, can't it? Yes, for everyone else, yes. Yeah. Um, I'm going to share in, in a little bit the, the video um, we interviewed uh, Lizzie talking about the not normal and normal. Yes, that's the very really good. That first? They're little sayings that a few of the grassroots commissioners have said. So we've got ones about how it's not normal not to be able to get hold of food. That it was easier to buy trainers rather than food, which is one of the ones that sticks in my head a lot. <laughs> Off the internet. That really sticks in my head. And some of the things that other people were experiencing that were not normal, I think, was there a sense that some of these are things that you experience normally anyway? Normally anyway, like being unable to work from home was a big thing, but now the pandemic's happened, everyone's working from home. It was never offered to people with disabilities before which is one thing we would have loved to be able to do. Because on a bad day, with some of the conditions that some of the people have and I have, we were unable to get into a workplace. So that, again, it doesn't necessarily make it easier for you, though, does it? But it's, it's the sense that you've got experience that other people now need to, can benefit from. Yep. Yeah. We're hoping that now people will be able to work from home more and disabled people will be able to take jobs that they're qualified for. And would that, that have a, a, a direct benefit for you, potentially? Could do, yes. So what are your kind of hopes for the Poverty Truth Commission now? I'm, I'm on a child, child um, hunger group, and I really am hopeful to work towards that, even if it's just to get some areas with a breakfast for the kids and don't go to school hungry. That'd be a lovely thing to ever happen. Now, I know that that's an issue that's important to you because I was watching my uh, TV news 
uh, yes. a few weeks ago. Uh, when, yes, when I was on the TV. Yeah, when Marcus Rashford launched his campaign. So you're from Wittenshaw, where no, yes. Marcus is too. So how did that come about? I was just in Civic and the news crew started talking to me. So I did mention that I was involved with Poverty Truth and they interviewed me. Um, so what, and about that campaign as well and about child hunger, what, why for you is that really important? I grew up going hungry and I have two children of my own and there's been times where we've not had food in the cupboards, when we've had our benefits sanctioned, stopped or a change of circumstance and they stopped paying us for six to seven weeks like they do. We've ended up with not, hardly anything in the cupboards and I hated having my child hungry. So you're you're like Marcus. This isn't this is a personal issue for you. Yes, very. So presumably you're back in the campaign. <laughs> very much so. If you check my Facebook feed as well, it's all about that. So you and you and you and Marcus now, yeah, thick as thieves. <laughs> I won't say that. He won't like me in my blue. Ah, that was good. I'm glad about that. <laughs> but. Uh, so great, great to, to have you on, Gemma, and great the work you're doing and really hope the Poverty Truth Commission does really have the kind of impact uh, that you're wanting. And also that Marcus Rashford's come. Well, it's a campaign that Marcus Rashford is uh, heading up, but there's lots of people back in that campaign to yep. end uh, childhood hunger. So, I know the church, the church um, thing as well. That, that we, I saw some stuff from them as well about it. Yeah, there's lot, lots of groups back in that camp. We're back in the campaign and we're hoping um, some people can share their stories as part of the campaign. So if you're up for sharing your story on social oh, yeah. media, um, uh, and we'll make you another media star, get you another opportunity. And it's really important that, that you know, people with first-hand experience are actually at the forefront of the campaign. So yeah. keep up the good work. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Here. Um, so we're now going to try uh, another go at sharing the video from uh, Manchester Property Truth Commission, which is uh, Lizzie, who's one of the facilitators, uh, explaining um, the particular initiative that Gemma mentioned um, about... Um, things aren't necessarily normal. As lockdown happened, we, we know that suddenly a whole load of people started to experience, um, you know, job loss or, or t struggling to get the food that they needed. Um, and, and we were aware that in some ways it's, it's a really good opportunity to, to get people to think about the fact that actually this is, this is normal life for a lot of people all the time but we didn't want to be kind of patronizing or be like you know yeah this is what it's always like um, we wanted to be really sensitive about that but still make the point to kind of get people to think about it, it, this is not okay it's never been okay it's not okay now um, and it should never be normal so um we we kind of ha we had a couple of meetings with our uh, commissioners and started to talk about what are the things that um, should never be normal um, and came up with some kind of sentences or phrases um, that, that should you know it should never be normal to not be able to access the food that you need um, and 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 then we did a session where we talked about this should always be normal it should always be normal to look out for your neighbours it should always be normal to be thankful to your bin men for doing the job that they do you know um and we we worked alongside the framing institute to word those phrases in a way that would hopefully have maximum impact and then we've kind of put put those together on social media on twitter um, and the response has been incredible i don't know what the engagement numbers have been but but it has become a, like a really powerful tool in helping people to think about wow you, you know this should never be normal and this should always be normal um yeah so that's that's kind of what we've been doing a little bit over lockdown
So uh, we're coming towards the end of the uh, session today. Um, and I think uh, we had been thinking we might have a panel conversation, but we've had some of our panelists seeking to leave. So I think uh, I just want to thank the, the people that have taken part and to, um, before we come to an end, we're going to have one last piece. Um, one of the things we've been doing um, over the past few um, weeks and months now, uh, it feels like uh, a longer time, is uh, a response in the form of creativity. Uh, lots of communities have been doing various things and we've highlighted Speaking Truth to Power, Mutual Aid, uh, the role of uh, experts by experience and, and engaging with uh, local authorities and power holders in various ways um, and sharing the skills and talents that we have. And the, one of the skills and talents that lots of people have um, is around creativity. Um, and we've had a group of people that have been sharing and learning and testing out their creativity over the past few months. Uh, brought together by um, uh, Matt Sowerby, um, who's been our um, poet in digital residence uh, since the start of lockdown. Um, so Matt, greetings. Hi, how you doing? Uh, really good. Glad to have you with us. Yeah, and, um, you're just finalising um, a piece of work which is uh, pulling together some of the work that's happened um, during during lockdown. So do you want to tell us about it? Yeah, so um, together with a, a, a panel of editors, um, I've been working to put together a, a poetry anthology um, that has been kind of collecting like all these diverse experiences of, of, of poverty and of lockdown. Um, <clears throat> And kind of like highlighting, sorry, my, my throat's a bit coarse, but highlighting like the power of these stories and um, but also like the highlighting the people behind the stories, highlighting their, their humanity, their joy, their humor, their hope, as well as the, the physical and mental strains of poverty as well. Um, so the the book is, it's a, it's a, I think it's quite a powerful experience reading it. It's been very powerful having all these um, these stories and pieces of art come in. Um, but it's also definitely um, a radical call for change. It's called to speak truth to power and to build back better. Um, and it's entirely built up of um, the poems by, by experts in poverty, whether that's experts by education, by engagement, or by first-hand experience, um, kind of all um, published alongside each other, um, which is very exciting. Um, so yeah, that's what we've been doing. Um, and it comes out on the 13th of October, I believe. Um, should be cool. Yeah, looking forward to it. So that's another another reason for looking forward to Challenge Poverty Week. So there'll be a launch event and uh, some of the people that have written some of the poems, I think, will be at the event. Mm. Um, and I think possibly is there an open mic session as well, Another um, a couple of creative events yeah. during the week. And yeah. the, uh, what's it called, the title of the...? Uh, it's called Same Boat. Same Boat. And do you want to make, explain a little bit what the reference to same boat is? Oh, just this idea of um, are we all in the same boat? Um, I, I found out this thing the other day, which is that the words crisis means uh, comes from a, a Greek word that means sieve. It's always about separating that people don't come together. But like even in the definition of that word, crisis is um, long term. We think that they bring us all together, but on some level they don't. They are always a divider or they, they widen the divides that are already there. Um, and so this, one of the big themes of this book was calling into question, like how much are we all in the same boat pulling through this thing together and how much um, is this actually broadening pre-existing like divides in our society? Um, you know, and that, that's something that the, the book riffs on in lots of different ways. And, and as a poet yourself, how important is it for you to use creativity as a tool to speak truth to power? Yeah, I, I think it's vital. Um, I, th I think it's part of our, um, our democracy um, that to, to have these stories but, and, and to share these stories. But I also think poetry offers something which is quite unique that you can't necessarily have in, um, in journalism or in, uh, in academic reports or in um, charity advertising, for example, because all of these have to um, kind of necessarily focus on the very 
either the very factual side of things or the very um, uh, traumatic side of of these issues. And but poetry is like an area where we get to we get to encounter the full person um, and the and the kind of the nuances and the complexities and the um, the, yeah, the humanity um, and of, of of the people affected by these issues and get to connect with them on a on a more um, yeah, I guess, in a more human level. Um, so that that's that's something that I think is really important as well, um, which is why I like um, using poetry for this kind of thing. And and the people that have been involved, you know, you've run a whole load of workshops. So not everybody that came to the workshops thought they were poets or had done much poetry. I mean, some people no. might be frightened of of the idea of writing poetry, but you know, what's your view? Can everybody be a poet? Is it is it? I think most people are. I, I, I think that um, if, if you said to someone, even people that write loads of poems and share them at open mics and stuff, if you ask them, like, are you a poet? A lot, lots and lots of people would say no, um, because we've, we've got this weird fear about that word. But like the amount of us that will like wake up in the two in, at two in the morning, kind of stressed about something and start scribbling something down uh, as just like a, a way to um, frame and understand the world better, or that will try and write the nicest messages that they can in their in their mom's birthday cards or um, we'll try and find the right thing to say when um, when a friend comes and wants some help. And these are all kinds of um, poems. Uh, the definition for poetry is something that academics have never been able to agree on. Um, and so I have no issue like thinking of those things as poetry as well. It's just like language used in a um, in a creative and more empathetic way, I guess. Um, and we're all we're all doing that all the time. Um, so yeah, it, definitely everyone can be a poet. So that's a message uh, to end with. Uh, everybody can be a poet. So if you've been inspired by anything that you've heard uh, in the past an hour, uh, go away and take a pen and piece of paper with you. Um, and whether it's now or at two in the morning, if you come up with an idea, just scribble it down. And who knows, it may turn into a poem. And it may appear in our next anthology of poetry. <laughs> So great, thanks, thanks, Matt. I'm really looking forward. To, I have seen uh, a draft of the the, uh, the anthology, and it's great stuff. So again, look out for that during uh, Challenge Property Week. Um, uh, and thanks to you, Matt. Keep up the good work. That's great. Thanks very much, Neil. So thanks to everybody who's been part of the session uh, over the past hour. Um, and. Um, yeah, um, I think hopefully we've shared some insights about community responses and just how creative they have been, just how much uh, it's been uh, about people helping each other, the idea of mutual aid, that it's not about some people uh, who have got all the, all the resources and other people who are uh, beholden to them and their charity, that actual mutual aid within communities has really come to the fore. Um, that uh, people's own experiences of uh, hardship uh, and of poverty uh, and the insights about how you get through in those difficult times, they too have come to the fore uh, and actually are insights that all of us are now uh, valuing. But also the importance of speaking truth to power, uh, whether that's through reports or, or poetry uh, or getting yourself on the uh, 10 o'clock news. These are all ways uh, in which communities can respond and have been responding. Uh, so I've been inspired by uh, what we've heard today um, and I hope you have too and look forward to joining you again uh, with the collective uh, in future. <laughs>